Good morning. It's uh, David Wood here from Vancouver, Canada, with my colleague Janar Sadhanathan, uh, my good friend Roxana, and the organizers have asked us to talk about TAVR and CAD, rationale and design of the complete TAVR trial. So our disclosures are noted. So complete TAVR. Um, I'm co-PI with John Webb on this uh, 4,000 patient, 103 centered trial. All the information that we're going to present is available on uh, clinicaltrials.gov with the identifier noted uh, or through uh, the CCI-CIC website. So we have a fabulous steering committee with um, John Cairns as our steering committee chair and other luminaries as noted there. Uh, both in the world of uh, transfemoral transcatheter valve replacement, as well as uh, acute coronary syndrome and percutaneous revascularization trials. Our core labs include the CT core lab led by uh, Jonathan Leipzig and Philip Blanke, and the coronary core lab circle led by John Mancini. So these are the sites that um, have so far signed on to participate in complete TAVR. Uh, I would argue these are some of the leading sites in North America, both uh, the United States and Canada. So a study objective. So among patients who've undergone successful elective transfemoral TAVR with a balloon expandable platform, we specifically chose a short platform. So hopefully there'd be no issues with coronary access post TAVI, who are receiving guideline directed medical therapy is a strategy of complete revascularization involving stage PCI using drug eluting stents to all suitable lesions. And here, this uh, for those who know the complete trial that I did with Shamir Meda and STEMI, we're using the same criteria, a 70% visual angiographic stenosis in a vessel at least 2.5 millimeters in diameter. We're not using FFR, IFR, um, and we're not using either a syntax score to start with or a residual syntax score at the end. If you see a 70% visual angiographic stenosis, that would be a qualifying lesion. If you're randomized to stage PCI, that would be treated. And the question is, is that approach superior to a strategy of guideline-directed medical therapy in the composite of death, new MI, ischemia-driven revasc, or hospitalization? So I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sadhanathan, who can take us through some of the background slides. Thanks, Janar. No, thank you, David. So I think um, just as to some of the rationale as to why this trial has been undertaken, I think it's clear to most uh, TAVI implanters that the presence of concomitant coronary artery disease is a fairly common occurrence uh, in patients that have been considered for TAVR. Um, and depending on what registry you look at, overall, it's at least half of patients in an all-comers population have some degree of concomitant coronary artery disease. The key thing is that all these are registry data, it's not core lab adjudicated. And you can see that even in the randomized trials, partner and the evolute low risk trials, the occurrence of concomitant coronary artery disease is common. Now, one thing to highlight is that when you look at recommendations from the guidelines, there's really not a lot of evidence to guide practice. Uh, so it's level C level of evidence. And as David will show you, there's significant heterogeneity in terms of practice. The other thing we don't know is firstly, who should have a PCI? And also secondly, when should the PCI be done? And really what we hope to show you is that really there's a need for a large appropriately powered randomized trial. So one of the key things here is that we know that the burden of coronary artery disease plays an impact in other clinical scenarios. And it would seem that based on early registry data and different multi-center reports, the same approach seems to be consistent in patients undergoing TAVR in that if you have a higher burden of disease as per syntax, this seems to be associated with worse outcomes. Now, of course, importantly, this is a recurring question. Should the PCI be done before or after? We have a number of series that are single center reports that have looked at this. And actually, as of November 24th, presented at Euro PCR was the activation trial, a small- This random, morning, yes, absolutely. this morning. Uh, a small randomized trial which showed that PCI before TAVR did not have an impact compared to medical therapy to one year outcomes. Uh, so clearly quite a timely study that's just been presented. So just to highlight this heterogeneity, these are two examples from our heart team rounds just last week, mm -hmm. David, right? Uh, these are two patients, both relatively young in their 70s. And as you can clearly see, this is patient A who's got two vessel concomitant coronary artery disease being considered for TAVR. And this is patient B, a very similar situation with disease in the LAD and in the RCA. And 
even within our local context, there was significant debate as to what should be the appropriate approach in these patients. Thanks, Janar. So at the start of this, I guess four months ago now, we sent out a site feasibility questionnaire to all 103 sites because we wanted to understand what was the practice currently and would, patient, would centers be willing to randomize per protocol? It's crucial if you're a clinical trialist that the transfemoral TAVR happens first. We're following these patients for a median of 3.5 years and it separated the efficacy and safety in time from the stage PCI. Uh, it's very challenging to do the PCI prior or concomitant to then separate out safety and efficacy. And we wanted all patients to have a transfemoral TAVR as part of their inclusion because we're gonna be following them for a median follow-up of three and a half years. So I think this is fascinating. All 78 sites who've completed the survey to date uh, believe uh, complete TAVR will influence global clinical guidelines. And all 78 sites are willing to randomize patients to stage PCI versus medical therapy one to 45 days post successful TAVR. But let's look a little bit deeper. And we're actually sending this survey now to a lot of our colleagues and friends throughout the world because we wanna get a sense, a snapshot of what's happening at the start of 2021 with regards to CAD. And I know you've had a lot of wonderful lectures on small annuli, pharmacotherapy post TAVI, uh, the SMART trial, others. So um, I think this is a fabulous time to be doing TAVI globally. So what proportion of cases also have concomitant CAD with at least one major vessel with a greater than 70% visual angiographic stenosis? Percentage on the x-axis, number of sites on the y. And you can see approximately half will have coronary disease, which is what we, is what we believe from the registry data. Mm -hmm. And then the next question, similar to the question we asked for the STEMI population with complete, what proportion of significant proximal LAD, CERC, or right? And again, approximately half. And I think this is absolutely fascinating. In your TAVR patients with CAD, what's your preferred approach? And we asked 2019 because obviously the pandemic changed um, people's normal practice for the last 10 months. Currently, about 60% uh, do PCI um, prior and 40% would do it um, only if the patient had recurrent symptoms or in a staged approach, which I think is fascinating. So you've got a 60-40 split of the 60 who would do PCI um, about 75% would do it prior to TAVR and a quarter would do it either at the same time as TAVR or after. But regardless of that, 78 of those 103 sites to date, and we're expecting to get hopefully all 103 to uh, complete the questionnaire, have agreed to randomize patients post TAVI. And I think that's supported by the small trials that have been reported today. Yeah. And uh, we had activation come out earlier. So I think this is crucial here. We only have a couple minutes left, but Let's just look. Symptomatic AS patients with at least one coronary artery lesion in a vessel that's 2.5 millimeters and heart team consensus that the anatomy is suitable for, for transfemoral TAVR and for percutaneous revascularization. They must have successful transfemoral TAVR with a balloon expandable THV. Obviously, if there's an intent to revascularize or they're going for surgical revascularization, that would be an exclusion. So after you have the successful transfermal TAVI, you're randomized the next day and stratified both by intended timing of PCI and requirement for oral anticoagulant. 2,000 in complete revascularization, 2,000 in medical therapy. The antithrombotic therapy, we've had a lot of discussion with the steering committee with Roxana, Rob Welsh. Right now, aspirin and clopidogrel for six months, then aspirin lifelong if you have PCI versus aspirin monotherapy for TAVI. If you require an OAC, which in this population, we expect our mean age is probably gonna be in the mid seventies, mm. is going to be uh, rivaroxaban and clopidogrel for six months, then rivaroxaban 20 lifelong. That may change as data comes out. Remember, this is a five-year trial versus rivaroxaban 20 lifelong if you're in the medical therapy arm. Median follow-up 3.5 years. We've gone through the primary outcome. Secondary outcome will also include fluoro time, contrast utilization um, for the stage PCI if randomized. I won't go through all this, it's all available in clinicaltrials.gov, but basically symptomatic AS, coronary artery disease, and consensus by the heart team, they're suitable for transfemoral TAVR and would receive a bypass distal to the lesion if they were going SAVR. And the exclusion are similar uh, to partner three. Anatomical exclusion criteria and clinical, again, identical to partner three, other than we've taken off by cuspid, mm -hmm. given now the uh, FDA indication. indication. Sample size calculation, 
Um, you can see there approximately 4,000, actually 4,060 patients. We plan to randomize uh, in January 2021. You can see the timeline. Last patient enrolled April of 2024, follow up April 2026 uh, with database lock. And we actually hope to randomize the first patients in Vancouver. Yeah, it's exciting to in, get started. In, uh, in December, which is amazing. This has all happened during the pandemic. So, in summary, this will be the largest TAVR study to date, and we'll have a median follow up of 3.5 years. In addition to the main findings, we envision more than 20 sub studies, at least 20 including coronary access, where we have 4,000 baseline core lab CT scans and 6,000 baseline core lab, core lab angiograms, antithrombotic therapies, stenosis severity, lesion location, obviously syntax, residual syntax, intracoronary imaging, CTFFR, quality of life, cost effectiveness. We've had studies proposed on left atrial appendage closer, all sorts of different things within this uh, hemodynamics. We believe there is clinical equipoise with regards to the benefit risk of PCI. That's the reason for the trial. All patients enrolled in complete TAVR will be elective. So these are not acute coronary syndrome patients and they must have symptoms. And the hypothesis here is there are the symptoms from the AS, the concomitant coronary disease or both. And we believe the trial will strongly influence global coronary transcatheter and surgical guidelines in 2026. So on behalf of myself and uh, Dr. Sadhanathan, um, thank you, and uh, if you're interested in the trial, uh, please reach out to us uh, as per the uh, attached slide. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.